Thank you, everyone, for coming, joining us tonight. Uh, this is our 22nd meetup in Australia. And welcome you all to joining in person or online. And uh, we, I can see many um, of you have joined us uh, not the first time, but still uh, also welcome to any new faces here. And we, uh, before we get started, I would like to, on behalf of Kasuk Australia, to share our acknowledgement of the country. Kasuk Australia respectfully acknowledges the traditional land of the Kulin Nation people. We pay our respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So this is the uh, QR code uh, to share with you. We encourage all of you to help to promote all the events um, by this QR code. You can upload, view, or download any photos. Um, but be, please be careful, do not delete any photos there. Thank you. So please let me quickly go through today's agenda. First of all, Yong Kam, the founder of Kasuk Global, and I will walk you through the journey of the Kasuk Group. Then we have the two featured speakers, Nilesh and Rush, here and share their topics with you. And what interesting is they both come from banking technology backgrounds, and also Nilesh is uh, uh, my colleague at NAP. And after their talks, we'll have a fun quiz with some swags gives away for the winners. Uh, this is didn't start at uh, the first uh, meetup, but I love this part. This is always fun and engaging. So just uh, be um, focused on the presentation later. Finally, we'll have an open Mac session for anyone who wants to share something, uh, whether you are looking for a job, hiring, or just uh, introduce yourself to the community. This is the moment for you. And of course, um, we uh, let's all come together for a group photo at the end to wrap up uh, this evening. So uh, Kasuk, um, we started uh, folks on enabling anyone interested in Kubernetes technology. And we have since expanded to include AI recently, given its rising importance and synchronage with Kasuk and Kubernetes. Our mission is to accelerate Kubernetes um, adoption. We are learning from each other and sharing the best practices. So we must thank to a big thank you to our uh, volunteers and the organizers um, in Australia. In the early meetups in Australia, I remember we only have had one or two uh, volunteers, including myself. And, uh, and yes, yeah, such a hard start with our meetup events. And now we uh, have grown, um, grown rapidly and we a bigger team now. Also include Sydney and um, thank you all the volunteers. Without you, we could make everything happen. And especially thank you um, for the helpers tonight, as well as uh, Sammy, my co-host for this event tonight. And also we are incredibly grateful for the support from our sponsors, whatever past and present. Without you, we couldn't make uh, this cozy spaces and delicious food and drink and create and relax atmosphere for everyone enjoying. And we especially thank for CNCF and uh, Cube Cloud, our main sponsors, and to AWS to providing uh, to provide the venues here to us uh, regularly every month. Tonight, uh, Kasut actually is covering food and drink tonight. So um, rest assured, there will be always food and drink um, for everyone, whether sponsored or not. So here is a quick look at our Kasut journey, highlighting how rapidly we 
we've expanded globally in just two years. So we started in Singapore in September 2022, following by Melbourne, Australia in April 2023, and Canada in August the same year. And in March of this year, we launched in the UK, and as well as by June, we had a presence in Sydney as well. Now we have events happening around the world. This, uh, yes, yeah, so, so joining, and also some uh, more groups are joining recently as well. So here are some uh, upcoming events. Um, just uh, follow us in linking or meet up. Um, keep uh, stay updated for the upcoming events. This is a few QR code. As, as you know already, we are getting more busy. So we appreciate more support, whatever you want to be joined us as speakers or volunteer or the sponsors. Yeah, we very appreciate your time and your support. So please um, capture the QR code and for yourself or anyone you know may be interested in. And also there are some multiple channels so you can follow us. Yeah, just take a picture if you don't have time at this moment. Um, okay, so next, I would like to hand over to our founder, Yong Kang, and to, yes, I have some very excited promotion. Yeah, thank you. Hand over to you, Yong Kang. Thanks, Jose. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have you got a hold of the cubes from us? No? The photo? <laughs> yeah? In the back? <laughs> Only me wearing. <laughs> So it's a program to encourage people to get the fully certified on Kubernetes. So I'm so happy, you know, I'm the first one globally. And that's where my phone also featured from our CNCF Linux Foundation training website to helping more people on their cloud native journey. If you complete all the Kubernetes certifications like a CKA, CKAD, CKS, KCNA, KCSA, you can get a blue jacket. I just want a blue jacket. <laughs> <laughs> so I did all the five Kubernetes certifications. And then after I complete all the certifications, I very much enjoyed to helping to encourage more people to get certified. And surprisingly, in Australia, we already have like five. Doesn't include me. I'm still counting in Singapore on the map. So there is a map to show where are the cubes remote. So in Australia, we already have the 12. Guess how many people in here in Melbourne? Almost every month I was talking about the teams show now. So we got seven people from Melbourne. The whole Australia got 12 or seven people from Melbourne. I'm so excited. But thank you everybody for me to, to learn to get certified. And also we have quite a few guys like a fresh angels here. He will join us to give a talk shortly. In the last month, we got Peter, also from uh, Melbourne. He did a, a talk. Uh, and plus, you know, the other one, uh, Akuga, also joined us. Uh, they are our constant uh, speaker. So not only they do the learning, they're also trying to share what they're learning. That's what we want to the, the community to grow. Yes. And some of them actually donate yeah, 50% of the vouchers including Rush and uh, Gary. There are a lot of people. So we, we are purely relying on the community, volunteers to help us. So people donate to us and then we share with the community for more people to get certified affordably. So I realized that it's, it's pretty costly, like a CK is 395 US dollar. That's too, too expensive. So with 50% off, yeah, it can be less than 200. It's, it might be doable. So I'd like to share a few uh, promotion codes. So some of these actually speculate for, for our community members. So which platform you guys are using for the Kubernetes loading? So anyone using Code Cloud? That's the best one. So we managed to get a 47% off 
So it will be much more affordable compared to the original price, like a four hundred fifty six dollars every two years. And also doing the certification. So, so I keep so trying to push actually out more from the community side. Even I'm somehow also indirectly helping Linux Foundation to promote their training their exams. But I keep pushing them to give us you know, more discount. Yeah, I want to say money. I want to our members, uh, community members also say money. But for now, we only have three percent. And uh, there is another one we used to have like a forty eight percent for the kids from our bundle. It was active right now. If I can, you know, persuade the Linux Foundation to make it active again, I will share. Anyone using Node.js? I'm actually I'm not a developer, so. Yeah, when I see there is a, a promotion for more, and yeah, maybe the other side of oh, actually the camera uh, blocked this one. So there is a 60% off for the loaning and the certifications for uh, Node.js. If you are a developer, if you are using, you might be interested. So we're going to, yeah, we can share the discount code in the email anyway. And also, there is a free loaning as well from a Linux Foundation website. Is that working? Oh, never mind. Yeah. Have you guys heard of the Cube Day? Cube Day. Cube Day Australia. Anyone is going? So Cube Day Australia. This, uh, yeah, no surprise. So we never hold it because it's the first time. First time we're going to have the Cube Day. It's a, it's it's a similar like a, you know Cubicon events. That's the CNCF the flagship uh, event globally uh, four times right now. North America, Europe, and then China and India this year. So Cube Day is uh, for the place there is no Cubicon. So they introduce something like a one day event. Uh, it's purely cloud native. So it's the first time of October weekends, we're going to have the Cube Day. So CNCF will have the Cube Day events here in Melbourne. So we managed to have a 20% off code. If anyone is joining, yeah, please don't pay for a price. It doesn't make sense. Are you guys happy with the 20% off? Is that still too expensive? Like a standard array, $390. Are you guys pay for it? Interested? Or your company pay. If your company pay, I don't care how much. <laughs> but if, if you ask me to pay the three on the three ninety dollars, even minus twenty percent, I'm not going to do it. So this is what I tell what I told the you know, Linux Foundation. You guys need to give us you know pay this come, otherwise it just doesn't work. So you have to understand you know the culture here. We're not used to pay like a four hundred dollar if the late pass like five hundred dollar for the, the one day event. Uh, hopefully, uh, let's see if they uh, adjust their mind. So most of them are in Europe or you know North America. So so for now, I managed to persuade them to give us uh, one one free pass. Okay, tonight. So once you guys complete the quiz time towards the end, we will have the quiz time. We will test what you guys learn. If you guys can look and answer the question correctly, so you will get to the top of the leaderboard. And you can choose one of the, you know, one free pass, it will be yours. Okay. That including our volunteers, uh, everyone included, uh, everyone can, can join. Okay. I hope this is useful to you guys. Does that help you guys? Yeah. Anyone interested to join the event? Yeah, 20% off if you like. Yeah. If you can, as I say, if you can persuade your company, yeah, 20% of the take it. If you can't, you know, let's wait. I'm trying, still trying hard to get more, you know, uh, free pass. If not free, heavy discount for us. So I personally, I like a different color, yeah. So the blue jacket is good, yeah. Uh, I completed all five Kubernetes certifications. I also completed all, you know, AWS certifications. And uh, I'm on the way. I want to get the good jacket. I just try to learn all different stuff to you know try to encourage more people to get certified. You might want to find the next exciting job by showing you can learn something new. It doesn't help. 
you need to have the growth mindset and especially the cloud and AI, all the different stuff. Things change very fast. By showing you can move fast. It might, can, might be able to help you to find the next exciting job quicker. That's what we are hoping to help in the community. Also, I want to introduce our landing page. I, I don't know how many, yeah, it looks like not many people know our landing page. Completely created by our volunteers. This is a powerful community. So people are coming back to help us create the landing page. If I click here, you can see, we actually, we also have the AI beauty. You can ask questions saying, when is the next meetup of, uh, meet of in Australia? And what about London? What about the, uh, Sydney, Toronto? So it's pretty cool. If you guys want to, give it a try. So I want a special thanks to our volunteers. It's Jeremy Bowen and Bohan. Uh, it is powered, the AI is powered by the Scholar AI. It's an open source software. So with that, let me introduce our uh, first uh, uh, speaker, Nilesh. Yeah, Nilesh is my friend. So he is our constant speaker in Singapore. Okay, he's a Microsoft MVP. He actually, he nominated me to become a Microsoft MVP as well. He just recently relocated to Melbourne. Yeah, I'm glad that he's interested to continue to help our community. He have a awesome talk project about the info community with the KS GPT. Anyone heard of the KS GPT? Yeah, that will be a very interesting topic. And after that, we have a rush from NAB. We'll give another very deep technical talk about the EKS custom networking. That's the real world experience from NAB's you know, platform engineering team. So let me first welcome uh, Nilesh to uh, come here to give a talk. Let's give him a round of applause. Okay, let's get started. So I think Yongteng did a great job in introducing me. Uh, before I talk about myself, I would request you guys to give a round of applause for this guy. He has been running community for a long, long time. You saw that uh, roadmap, right, when he started. I still remember the kind of impact he had in Singapore, and it's like just growing across the globe. So please, thanks, Yankan, for all this. So let's get started with the topic about how to improve Kubernetes with uh, KTS GPT. KTS, as you know, is a short, from, a short form for Kubernetes, and GPT is about generative AI. So I'll showcase some of the features of this open source uh, tool. A uh, quick thing about myself, I think Yonkan, he talked about this. I've just put some social media links and I'll also share it later towards the end. So let me just skip this part. And before I talk about KTS GPT, a brief background about myself. I tend to put this because I come from a small place in India called Goa. Anyone has heard about Goa? Okay. So Goa was a Portuguese colony and unlike the rest of India, Portuguese ruled Goa for like 450 years. Even after India got independence from British, Goa was ruled by Portuguese for 14 more years. So because of this, we in Goa have a distinct culture, architecture, style of living, food, and we have a very beautiful beaches. Uh, Goa is like a tourist capital of India. That's how I like to say it. So if you happen to go to India anytime, please try to visit this place. It has got beautiful churches, temples, and obviously the beach part. So coming to today's session, I'm going to use a demo application. Uh, this is like a typical uh, three-tier application. It has a front end. It has two APIs. This is like an event management kind of application. You can think of like a tech talks. There is a producer producing certain amount of events and there is a consumer. Uh, I use this application as part of one of the series I'm doing on YouTube. Uh, it's called the Cloud Native Ninja. It's about how you build applications right from you know, starting with code, then containerize it, put it on uh, Kubernetes and different environments. And I'm also using polycloud programming for this. So I've used .NET Core, Java, Go, and Rust as programming languages. And all this source code is available on GitHub if you want to have a look at it. 
Now to decouple the communication between the producer and consumer, I'm using RabbitMQ as a message broker. And even to elevate that experience further from a developer experience point of view, I'm using a distributed application runtime called as Dapper. Anyone has heard of Dapper? Yeah, few people have heard about it. Again, if you are building cloud native applications, I would suggest have a look at that. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, architecture for this application. And I've already gone ahead and deployed this on a Kubernetes environment. So let's go and have a quick look at the Is it visible at the back, like the font, or you want me to increase it a bit? Can you see it? Okay. So uh, let's run a very simple command, like kubectl get pods. And as Yang Kong was saying, right, there are a lot of people here who are kubesternet and who know about Kubernetes. So I think someone hit a button somewhere. <laughs> okay. Let's wait for the screen to come down. Ooh. Is this some special effect? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so those of you who are experienced with Kubernetes, right? What do you see here? Yeah, so there is a RabbitMQ running. There is a producer pod running. Hello. There are four instances of producer running. And the last one, if you see, there is a crash loop back off. So those who are experienced with Kubernetes, uh, how do you start debugging this? What are the possible areas you will look at? Okay. Oh, hello, Nilesh. Okay, so look at the logs, describe the pod or deployment, see the events. Good. So let's say I give you a choice between one and five. Pick a random number. Three. Okay. I don't know what is that for you. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so that is what we usually do, right? when we are debugging, when there is a problem. Now, in this case, when I deployed this application, the producer API, uh, it has a deployment in terms of Kubernetes objects, and there is a service which exposes the producer. When it comes to the consumer, there is only the deployment. There is no service exposing the consumers outside because the consumers, they are just consuming messages from the RabbitMQ. So I don't need to expose it uh, outside my Kubernetes cluster. Now, in this case, let me switch back to the presentation mode again. Now, this is what usually we do, as some of you mentioned, right? We start looking at uh, starting with logs or we go into events. And is the screen visible at the back? Can you see it clearly? The workflow? No? How about this? It's the first half. Okay. So these are usual steps. But what you see here is there are so many hops we have to take, right? just to get to the root cause, where the problem started. Now, if we go with the flow, we will first look at the pods, then we describe, then we look at, uh, maybe looking at uh, the bottom side here, uh, do the pod name, then check if there is readiness probe, if there are any problems, if that is fine, then go into the next steps. And then when it comes to the service, you start looking at port mapping is the ports if assuming your pod is working fine but your ports are not mapped correctly then you will start looking at this if your service is fine then you look at your ingress now i say this is simple because we are just looking at the deployment and the service how does this look can you see it at the back yeah it's an iceberg well it's not your problem that you can't see it it's the fact that Kubernetes is quite complex. You look at the top two layers. This is what I call like a happy path scenario. When you start learning containers and Kubernetes, you start with 
a pod, you start with deployment, you start with uh, maybe ingress, then you do uh, config map, you do a service. Things start getting complicated as you move down that stack. When you want to do stateful services, when, when you want to do like networking related policies, when you want to do uh, custom resources, when you want to have uh, various things which are like the Kubernetes objects or the policies and all those things, they themselves are very vast. Then when we talk about CNCF, you would have seen the CNCF landscape because CNCF is one of the sponsors of this event, right? If you go on to the CNCF landscape, you will see huge number of projects. And these projects, they're all growing. We are looking at applications and databases here. Same way, they have CI, CD, streaming, messaging. Then you go on to security, compliance, automation, registry, storage, then scheduling, service mesh. And in a enterprise grade scenario, or even in a slightly like matured scenarios, you would be using more than one of these uh, ecosystem of projects. You would hardly work with vanilla Kubernetes in any case. You would always have more than one of these projects being used. And when you are having these multiple options or multiple services being used, when the problem happens, it could be quite difficult and tricky to identify where the problem comes from. So that's where KTS GPT comes into the picture. Let me switch to the demo mode again. And let's start with what is KTS GPT? What is it trying to do? It's an open source project. And they say that they are debugging powered by AI. There is an AI component, and we can look at integrating the backend for KHS GPT into various uh, large language models. So, what are the backends which are supported? We have this concept of uh, authorization providers or auth. And when I list, maybe let me just clear and put it back again. So you see, these are the list of providers. There is OpenAI. We can have a local AI provider. We can have Olama, Coher, uh, Amazon Bedrock, Amazon SageMaker, uh, Google, NoPI, Hugging Face. Uh, there is Oracle, Watson. And I have configured this to run on Azure OpenAI. So I can choose any of these backends. I can even configure multiple backends and switch between the backends. The default one is OpenAI. So when we configure the backend, there is basically uh, metadata related to each type of backend and the configuration would be slightly different depending on which backend you are using. Uh, it's like you will have to provide which is the URL and what's the key to access that particular backend. Once we have set up that, then we can say, uh, use this backend and tell me what is the problem with my cluster. So I can run this command like, uh, let's start with analyze. Analyze is one of the command. And in terms of the analysis, it can do various things. Like, uh, it can have uh, explanations. It can filter based on a type of the objects. It can do an interactive thing, which we will see. Uh, it also has the language support. Not everyone is native English speaker, so if you want, you can ask KTS GPT to explain what's the problem and a probable solution in one of these supported languages like Spanish, French, German. Uh, I think there are 11 or 12 different languages which it supports. So let's start with the first one, which is I want to analyze what's wrong with the cluster. And we see that there are seven errors which it is reporting. Uh, it will tell you what's the object, like there is deployment, pod, service, uh, which namespace it is in, and the name of the Kubernetes object. It will also tell what is the error. Like if we look at the first one, it says deployment. It has three replicas, but four are available. So in my deployment configuration, I have said replicas as three, but this in particular instance, there are four replicas running. And same way, it will tell what is the problem with the other uh, issues. But we also see the AI provider 
here it says AI not used. And to use the AI, we need to set the explain flag or we need to provide explain. So let's do that. And now what it does is for every problem, it will go and it will show you what is the error, but it will also explain that error. And it will tell you what are the possible solutions. So you can look at the first one that it says use kubectl scale command to scale down the deployment to the desired number of replicas. It also tells you what is the command to do that. It tells you how to verify that. And it says the error should be resolved. Uh, and same way for the others. Now, uh, the Tech Talks producer that I have, there is an intentional error there where the tag is not mentioned correctly. And that also you can see that it's able to uh, identify and it's giving again these suggestions that you first look at the correctness of the image and clearly this tag is not correct. So imagine instead of me doing all those steps, describing then looking at the events, looking at uh, the logs and going into individual objects. This is like in one shot, I'm able to get all the issues that are there with the cluster and also possible solutions, how I can fix that. Now, there are other products in the market which can possibly do this. You might ask what's the great thing about this. What I find interesting is the interactive part of this. Because AI or Gen AI is all about prompts, right? So if I add the interactive, it gets into the prompt mode and then I can start asking questions. I can say, how many issues are there? Seven issues. Then I can say, how many are related to tech talks? And you see the typo there, but it is still able to infer that I'm thinking it's about tech talks. It's able to have that context and it tells that based on the given context, there are three errors related to the tech talks. So far, so good. Now, I want to say how to fix the first one. Okay. It will be able to get this information and it will be able to tell me what to do. And to come out of interactive mode, I can just say exit, it will come out. Uh, is there anyone who is uh, French speaking here? Okay. I like to tell some stories. Okay, so please bear with me. <laughs> I used to work for this French bank in Singapore and I used to travel to France but my French is pretty bad. So I went to one of these remote places in France on one of the long weekend. And unfortunately, the bread and back breakfast place where I was staying, the lady, she didn't know English. So I went to her and I said, Je ne pas parler français, vous parlez anglais. You understand what I said, right? Is my French accent anywhere close to the French thing? Is it grammatically correct? Okay. Uh, can you just translate it for others? What did I say? Yeah. So I asked this lady saying, I don't know French. That means I don't know French or I don't speak English. Do you speak English? And she looked at me. She smiled at me. And she says, you speak so well French. Why do you ask me to mess with English? So the reason I say this is because I was telling you, right, we can get this in different languages and I remember French. So I can give, let's remove the interactive. I can give the language here. So let's say I want the explanation in French. So although the issue is in English and most of the places we will find in uh, programming languages or logs or errors, they are mostly given in English, right? But if you are not a native English speaker and you want to get this in other language, you can get the explanation. Uh, now, my friend, you can have a look and see if it is anywhere close to 
being correct or not. <laughs> okay, how about Chinese? We have some Chinese people here speaking. Yeah, okay, let's try Chinese. And I don't have a story to tell about Chinese, although I lived in Singapore for 14 years. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't pick up Chinese as much. Okay, so what do you think? Good? Yeah. So I hope you find the usefulness of this. Sorry? I feel there's more steps in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> uh, ideally, should not be. <laughs> Uh, because it's just doing a translation, but using Gen AI, but uh, I don't think there is uh, different steps. Uh, maybe because of the character size, uh, you feel that there are more. Uh, yeah, so I was saying the language part, right? And I don't uh, speak Chinese or I don't understand much Chinese, although I spent 14 years in Singapore. Uh, how about Spanish? Anyone? Spanish speaking around. Okay. <laughs> Hola is the only thing I know in Spanish because my younger daughter, she used to see uh, Dora the Explorer. <laughs> okay. Let's do Spanish and then we will move on to the next feature. I don't bore you with all the languages. Or did it add one more step here? <laughs> did it become eight like <laughs> steps? Do Spanish people like to talk more, like give more detailed instruction? <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, the next feature of KTS GPT that I would like to show is about the filters. Now, if you look at this, it is actually, uh, there was like a lag, right? When I say uh, Spanish, it was actually sending the data back to OpenAI and it was getting that response. So it will send those many tokens every time we ask for a resolution or ask for a problem. So to reduce that, what you could do is you can filter. If you know exactly now, in my case, I have just the service and the pod which is giving a problem. Uh, in here, I can uh, say, explain me, but just I want to filter based on the pod and the service only. I don't want all other things that you want to analyze. And in this case, uh, it reduced the number of uh, errors. It was seven earlier, if you saw the first time I ran this, now it's saying only six. So uh, there are a lot of filters that we can apply and we can have a look at uh, those as well. So when I run the KTS GPT filters list, you will see the active filters in green. Uh, these are the default ones, uh, starting with PVC, we have the validation webhook, uh, there is pod, deployment, replica set, cron job, node, and uh, ingress, stateful set, et cetera. There are also others which are available as part of the package, but they are disabled by default. And in your environment, if you are running things like network policies and uh, horizontal pod auto scalers, you're using uh, pod disruption budgets and all. You can enable this, and it's just a simple command to enable it. And next time the scan runs, it will pick up these filters and it will uh, analyze your cluster based on this. Now, this was all about what comes packaged as part of the KTS GPT itself. But we looked at so many tools as part of CNCF, right? What about integrations with these tools? So. There is a very limited set of integrations, and let's look at those integration points as well. I will go through the list of supported integrations. Is it visible at the back, or shall I bring it up? Can you see it? Okay. Uh, so right now, there are five 
uh, starting with uh, Trevi, there is Prometheus, AWS, Keda, and Kivano. So these uh, other services or these other products are supported currently. Nothing of them is being used, uh, but we can integrate with these products. So let's see one of the integration. Uh, anyone has heard of Trivi or is using Trivi? Yeah. So Trivi is like an open source uh, scanner. It's a project which scans your uh, containers for any vulnerabilities. So let's go and enable the Trivi integration here. We do this by activating Trivi. And what this will do is it will install some of the components in the Kubernetes cluster required for running the uh, Trivi related scans. Is it Trivi or Trivi? I don't know how you pronounce that. Uh, Trivi. Okay. So the activation has uh, been done. Uh, at the bottom, we see that green message uh, activation activated integration Trivi. Let's see how we can use this. So when I activate the Trivi, uh, let's see what are the filters it is adding. So KTS, GPT, and the list of filters again. It's gone and added this vulnerability report and config audit report as two <clears throat> new filters. And we can see that integration thing as a uh, indicator that this is not the default one, but it's coming from the other products which are there. Now let's try and run the analysis again and see uh, what's the impact on the number of issues which it is reporting. I'll go with analyze and explain. This might take a few seconds because it's going to incorporate those two additional filters now in the scan. Okay, it was quicker than I expected. So here, now we can see the list has gone to how many, 68. So it has added all these additional items and it tells me what is the uh, CV, how many vulnerabilities are there. Uh, we can see the type is vulnerability report, which object is having that particular vulnerability, what's the CV, what's the risk, critical, high, medium, low. It will also tell what is the root cause of this and what is the solution. So pretty handy in my opinion. And this again, if I want, I can put those filters. Instead of running everything, I can just say, uh, give me only the vulnerability report. So let's switch back to the presentation and do a quick recap of what did we see. So we looked at the different backends that are supported by Gate uh, I'm using the Azure Open AI, but all these others are supported. Then we have the filters. I showed you the active filters, as well as the ones which are unused, but we can enable them. Then there are the integrations, and we looked at the trivia integration. Now, in summary, I would say that uh, K8S GPT, uh, so far what I have experienced is uh, it helps in improving the debugging experience. Uh, if you are spending more time debugging issues in Kubernetes, uh, this K8S GPT can help you to identify them quickly and even the resolutions as you saw. It will propose what is the solution for fixing that issue and uh, possibly reduce the amount of time you are spending on investigating the issues. Uh, it can help you to really improve the productivity, whether you are a developer or uh, sysadmin or cluster admin. Uh, it supports all these backends and uh, integrations. They allow us to extend the external tools and services. Uh, this is what we saw in the session. But apart from this, in terms of the feature, it also supports remote caching. Now, you saw that when I ran the explain command, it was taking a bit of time to get these results. And if we have some frequently accessed data, we can cache it to a remote location like S3 bucket or uh, Azure Blob Storage, and that will help in again speeding those uh, responses. 
And the next step in this is, it would be really good if somebody could do this automatically for us. We are all about automations, right? Instead of someone sitting and running these explain commands, if somebody could do it automatically and create SGPTs as this Kubernetes operator, you install this operator in your cluster, you can connect the output of this to uh, Prometheus and have a dashboard in Grafana. So all that can be automated to a great extent. And I've done that part in one of my YouTube videos. If you want to have a look at how to do that, uh, these are some of the videos I've done specifically around KATS GPT. If you want to learn about uh, how to install KATS GPT, the best place is to look at the doc. It's uh, docs at kthsgpt.ai. And uh, if you want to contribute, then they have this open source on GitHub as well. For the CNCF part, uh, you can have a look at that landscape.cncf.io for all those projects that I showed. And again, if you joined a bit late, those are my social media handles. Uh, I never had a problem getting a very easy name because the combination of my first and last name is quite unique. So it's very easy to find me anywhere on the social media. Uh, in case uh, you want to connect with me, please feel free. With that, I would conclude the session here. Are we taking the questions now or later? Do we have some time? Okay. Yeah, maybe a couple of questions. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. So, oh, okay. Um, yeah, my question. Uh, um, so, um, that tool can uh, use the model to analyze your um, Kubernetes clusters. And I'm just worried about if you um, put the, the training result to the model. So, worry about the policy. Very good question. One to four. Choose a number. Four. <laughs> okay. Again, I don't know. That's a really good question, and I forgot to mention about that. Uh, but I was expecting someone to ask this type of question. So uh, I think I forgot to put it again in the summary, but let me go on to the terminal and let's have a look at this. Kate SGPT has uh, one thing which is. Uh, Okay, it's the analyze. You can say analyze ZE or SE, it's an ADS. You have the option to anonymize. So if you have any sensitive data, you can use this anonymize flag and it will anonymize the data for you. The first one here, flags, hyphen A or hyphen hyphen anonymize. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, on the whole, what's happening? I mean, how do we authenticate to that? Or how we connect it to that in uh, yep. GPT module? And are we sending the log to the GPT module and GPT is in turn summarizing the um, GPT module logs and presenting it in human understanding? Is that, is that what we want to do? Yep. So to add a, a provider, right? Uh, this is how we do it. So you see lines 23 to 28. So uh, we give the name of the provider. In this case, the backend I'm using is uh, Azure OpenAI. Then we specify the URL. And uh, engine is like uh, in terms of Azure OpenAI, it's the deployment that we are doing in the Azure OpenAI service. What's the model? I'm using GPT 3.5 Turbo here. And then the API key. So depending on which provider you are using, this metadata will vary slightly, uh, but it will be able to, con as long as uh, your KATS GPT can connect to that uh, large language model, it would be able to give you the suggestions. Thank you. Yeah. One to three. <laughs> Sorry. Four. Two. Two, okay. <laughs> Yeah.
Uh, yes, it does. So again, uh, let me go back to the slide. So in terms of the models, uh, it does. There is uh, this one, the green one, that's the local AI icon. It does. I did try it. It uh, depends on what model you are using. Then. Uh, even local, you can have like, uh, you can get a model from Hugging Face. The open source model, and you can try running it using Llama, for example. Yeah. Just with the analyzing, um, you can analyze for 90 sites, it doesn't have yes, you can. Um, which 90 sites, I think you have to use service panels, don't you, or permissions to let it analyze different types of responses. I haven't looked at the role-based access if it restricts something on the RBAC side of things. Uh, but in terms of analyzing by namespace, yes, you can see in the analyze option, uh, namespace is one of the option you can specify. So you can filter by specific namespace as well. One or two? One. One? <laughs> I've got only one left. So probably the last day for the last session. I know you guys probably have a lot of questions, but you don't want to stay here for the whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You see the tag here, it's strongly specified. And let's do one last thing. Let's hope that it works. So I fix the tag and I'm just redeploying the application. And then I will yeah, one last thing before I hand it over to no the problem. Yes. Uh, so when we do the integrations, right? Like you did the yeah. If I want to integrate Kera, so what entity is supplying the mindset for me? Is it the backend or is it from a public health repository? Uh, for Keda, you mean? Yeah, like when you enable it to be, I have seen CRD be uh, created. Created, yes. Yeah, so what entity is supplying the manifest files for that? That is taken care by the integration. So when we add the integration, it will automatically add those CRDs, whatever is required for Trivi. Okay. So you still need to use, like if you have Keda running in your cluster, uh, you still have to use whatever method you are using for deploying Keda and creating your scaled object and all those things still remains the same. What KTS GPT would be able to do is to analyze that scaled object. And let's say you have trigger authentication for Keda. If there is any misconfiguration with that, it would be able to check that and highlight that to you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Manish. That was a very good talk. Thank you. Very, you know, amazing table. I also learned a lot. I wish you know we can have more time for the questions. Yeah, let's probably better keep the questions in the end. Okay, let's give him a round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll hand it over to Dash. Yeah, next uh, we have uh, Rashi from Nat. He also have an uh, amazing talk about the EA custom journal. I, I, I think this side of the thing is I don't understand. Yes. <laughs> so all right, very good point. Thanks, Rush. Thanks for that. Uh... By the way, he is also wearing the blue jacket. If yes. you guys saw the list earlier. He's also one of the very first Thanks. Thanks. But somehow CNCF, I, I don't like them. It took like ages, you know, for the blue jacket to deliver here. I mean, I honestly got to know from you, to be honest, when I joined the first meetup. And when you just mentioned it, I promised myself, no, I mean, I'm not going to go for it. But you keep on posting in LinkedIn. 
very tempting, I need to say. So I just thought I'll give it a go. I couldn't get, couldn't get it um, out of my head. Every time when I check your LinkedIn, keeps on sharing. So it's a good thing. Awesome. Yep. Let's let's leave here. I'm not a boss. All right. Thanks. Um, thanks, Nilesh. Uh, wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed. Probably gonna talk to one of my managers and see whether we could uh, get KPD KTS GPT in one of our clusters. I think Paul Paul is here from NAB. Um, Susan, you probably know how many things we have to troubleshoot uh, every day. So I'm Russia in the Gunawardena. Um, unfortunately, I forget to have a slide about where I'm from, but I'm not far away from Goa. Um, actually, I'm from Sri Lanka, so probably in the map now I sh shared, you probably would have seen the Sri Lanka as well. And fun fact is that, yes, our country was also governed by Portuguese. We also have lovely churches. I'm a Catholic myself. And we got beaches around the country, so it's an island. If you ever visit, that would be fantastic. Um, so I'm a, one of the principal engineers at uh, NAB Engineer Foundation, um, which I call it uh, NEF. I've been a um, principal engineer for nearly three years. And um, I'm an AWS SME as well. So I contribute for some of the exams um, you probably might be sitting. So don't curse me uh, if the questions are hard, but um, try to keep it very low. And I'm also one of the Cube astronaut. Um, thanks to this group who convinced me to um, be one of them. So, um, so before I go to um, the things which I'm going to talk about in here, um, EKS custom networking, um, I just want to give you a bit of an understanding about what's the um, how the platform engineering works at uh, National Australia Bank. So, NEF, which is known as NAB Engineering Foundation, is the one of the is the central team for managing nearly um, three hundred EKS clusters across nearly 200 tenants. And you must be wondering, yes, that's huge. And what that means for a person like me, um, I have to log into these clusters each and every day and probably run close to 500 commands. So a tool like KGPT probably gonna help me my life a little bit. I'm probably gonna help my hell us a little bit. Um, so that's that. And we also have like um, 15 Azure clusters as well. And um, the one of the things, so that's a bit of a background on um, how we operate. We are the, one of the teams which provides core capability in terms of deploying application as well as the deployment uh, platform. Um, at NAP, primarily we started with ECS, but uh, we wanted to um, exercise a multi-cloud deployment platform. And that's why we started using Kubernetes platform. What that means is that uh, we we are migrating the existing ECS cluster, uh, the workloads which is running in ECS clusters, um, to the Kubernetes platform, and that means including everything. And um, I just thought of giving a background because um, I just thought it would be really important um, before I explain the problem statement. Um, the problem statement which I'm trying to explain here is that. Uh, Bigger corporation like, um, I don't know the word bigger is very um, comparative, but uh, a corporation like NAB, we look at it, um, the the IP pool, the private IP pool is actually divided into a lot of um, areas. For example, if you look at it, um, the private IP pool is divided between prod and non-prod, which is straightforward. And we also have different concepts called internal landing zone and protector landing zone. So what that means is that um, if you have highly critical applications um, which is running, they need to run in protector landing zone. If it is not critical, if it is just like providing a microservice, um, they could be running in internal landing zone. And also you got, we still have on-prem applications as well as we got multiple cloud platforms as well, primarily Azure and AWS. We also have a bit of a footprint in G, um, um, Google Cloud. So if you look at all these things, your private IP pool is pretty much going to be divided across many sections. And if you look at the AWS itself, your private IP pool is going to be divided between ECS and Kubernetes as well. 
because we how you operate uh, your ECS clusters and how you operate your EKS clusters is a little different. And the permission which is required to operate these clusters in a given VPC and subnet uh, for a particular tenant is slightly different. So you can't actually, you still can, but um, trying to exercise the best practices, you probably need to separate the subnets and the VPCs where your ECS and EKS clusters running. And that leads to a problem when we are trying to scale the Kubernetes platform for nearly 200 tenants, that means 300 EKS clusters. That means is that um, we, got, we got very little IP pool, like a private IP pool. So if, you're, if your organization is actually having EKS clusters and if you have like a massive, not a massive, at least let's say like a reasonably big um, footprint of using EKS clusters, you probably would be in, uh, facing the same problem, especially the financial institute, because you need to scale. So what that means is that um, you, you get a limited IP pool to deploy your 300 EKS clusters. And you still would be thinking, yeah, sure, if you still have 200,000 IPs, would that be enough? And trust me, two years ago, I saw, I thought the same. And two years ago, unfortunately, our platform created clusters with 2,000 side ranges, which led to an IP exhaustion problem, situation where at one point, we, we ran out of IPs to provision our EKS clusters. And that's where we got the point that, yeah, sure, look, we need to be, we need, I mean, we have been talking about on-demand capability in terms of compute from, from the day where cloud started. I mean, everyone who has done yeah, any cloud or you know about the cloud, one of the first things which you hear is that, how do we get the on-demand compute capacity? I mean, that that's one of the main selling points, right? I mean. We don't want to buy a huge, um, P, uh, like a PC, because you can scale. But scaling the side ranges once an EKS cluster is being created has been always a challenge. I know some of the things have changed over the years, but if you look at it, how you gonna provision an EKS cluster with infrastructure as code, it's gonna be very challenging to scale an EKS cluster, especially the, the side ranges without having an outage. So some of the problems we want to, I mean, the main thing which we want to give to our tenants is that how can we give an on-demand IP or side ranges capability for our tenants? What does it mean? The main thing which I want to exercise in here is that we don't want to start a tenant with 2000 IPs because that's too much. And after six months, we found out most of the tenants are not even using 200 IPs for their workloads. And we also want to make sure that we start with a small side range and we have the capability to scale out. That means if the tenants start using, tenants start deploying more workloads, we should be able to cater that, uh, their subnets and side ranges. And one of the other things is like, we don't want to hurt their active, active workloads because they are already uh, deployed the applications and they're actually receiving traffic. We want to do it in a way that they don't have to redeploy and they don't have an outage. And, and it, the experience is plug and play. Let's say that if I have a cluster with 500 IPs, if I need another 500, it should be just plug and play. And the solution for that was EKS custom networking. This solution has been there for quite a long time. It's a very simple solution. Um, as the young mentioned, it is very complicated. It's a very powerful tool. And I myself, honestly, um, was trying to solve a problem. Uh, I mean, solve a um, finding solution, how we can um, expand the cluster. Some of the option is like, you know, maybe start using different node groups. That's a good option as well. But it is also required to make changes in your cluster. But doing that work or the research, the NEF or the NAB Engine Foundation, we were able to find out that, yep, EKS custom networking is one of the best solutions which we can use. And even much better 
if you if you couple your Ingress custom networking with RFC 6598 side arrangers. And you must be wondering, yep, what is he talking about? What is this RFC 6598 side arrangers? If you heard about carrier grade NAT or like, you know, the, uh, the IPs which your ISPs are using, they're pretty much called the RFC 6598 or CG NAT side arrangers. So don't look at this. I'm just going to put these bullet points just to give an introduction, but I'm just going to do a demo. And I'm just going to explain using this one with this diagram. I know this diagram looks pretty busy. Um, when I reviewed my power pack with Paul, he said, you know, look, don't, don't make it uh, too busy because uh, people will lose focus. But I'll try to break it down a little bit. So the first thing is that um, if you just go home today and, you know, just create and bust in host and use the EKS cuttle command uh, to create an EKS cluster, it creates a couple of stacks. The first one is like, you know, it creates the request, uh, the prerequisite VPCs and the subnets. And it then once that is being created, it will create the your EKS cluster. And what I what I have highlighted here is that how a normal cluster would look like. It's a, it's a very basic um, diagram if you looked at it. It what it says is that you got your control plane, your EKS clusters, which will be using the same side arrangers, and you got the um, node group which will be using the same side arrangers and you got your um, applications uh, workloads, actual workloads, which will be using the same side arrangers. What that means is that if you happen to deploy a workload here, it will be consuming an IP from the same subnets where your clusters are running. So you must be thinking, yep, sure. Even the Amazon EKS cuddle creates the same way. So why is it not a big, why is it not a, what, what's the problem there? There are quite a lot of number of problems there. One of the things which I can tell you is that, let's assume that this particular side of range, there are number of pods which is being created and you run out of IPs in this side of ranges, then the cluster needs to scale out. I'll repeat that question again. What will happen if you run out of IPs on this side of ranges because the tenants keep on deploying workloads but your cluster needs more CPU and memory, so it tries to scale out. We actually had that problem at NEF. So the cluster couldn't actually scale out. The cluster of the scale was running, that's fine, but it couldn't actually scale out because it did not have any IPs. That was an actual problem uh, NAP phase during the, when we are rolling out these Kubernetes clusters. So when we're talking about how we gonna implement the EKS custom networking, there are a few prerequisites for that one. So as mentioned, you can see here, um, you have your default subnets, which will be used for your control plane and for your node group, and you don't, you don't mess with it. And the good thing about it is that you only need to worry or only need to provide uh, resize or size your subnets only to cater, only to cater the number of work, um, worker nodes which you're expecting in your cluster. What that means is that if you if you have done some capacity planning in your cluster, and if you think that, yeah, sure, these are the requests and the limits of a given workloads, and we're going to have this number of workloads, and if you, the, um, the size of your EC2 instance which you're going to use for your workloads, and you can probably think that at max we'll be having like 40 or 60 EC2 instances or like workloads or worker nodes. So you only need to worry about the number of worker nodes you're going to have when you're provisioning these side range um, subnets. That's number one. That's that's pretty much what we do. And the second thing is that you can use the same subnets for the um, for your node groups, but you can choose to use different subnets if you wanted to. And that's no problem with that. It's up to you. Um, the EKS custom networking is not about choosing different subnets to your no, uh, node group that has no bearing. Um, however, the security groups which you are using for these node groups and the cluster would have an impact. I'll come back to that later. And the third thing which I want to tell is that, the th third prerequisite is that you need to create three subnets with the CGNAT side arrangers, uh, CGNAT, CGNAT side arrangers. 
There's a significance in this United side ranges. You must be asking, hey, Russian, this is, isn't this a private IP? I mean, what's the difference? The key difference, what we managed to actually utilize in the CGNAT is that, as I mentioned, we got 200 tenants. And we wanted to provide a solution at NAB where we could actually reuse the same subnet across the 200 tenants. And that's why we, so our first iteration, our first rollout was EKS custom networking. And then what we found out is, yeah, yeah, sure. Why can't we use the CG net? There were quite a lot of things which you need to do to do that. I'll come back to that. As I mentioned, the significance is that, the main significance is that we can reuse these subnets across the 200 tenants. I'll repeat that again. So you can reuse this one across the 200. The main thing is that you're not burning your private IPs when you have the capability of just reusing the CG net across the 200. That was our, that was the big win. Because as I said, we we were in a like a, um, uh, like a frozen situation or like we, we had to freeze our onboarding tenants for a, for a period because our, our other platform was actually running out of IPs because of the cluster configuration. And our EKS platform was actually, couldn't actually get secondary siders to provision new clusters because we didn't have enough IPs. So the, the capability or the ability to reuse a side range across the same tenants across the 200 tenants was the big win which we had. And so once you have created this RFC 6598 side ranges, then you're ready to go. And then the next stage is that, how are we gonna actually implement this one? So if you look at it here, I hope it is clear. Um, so you can see here, there are a few things which you need to do to improve, um, install the EKS custom networking. The first thing is that, as I mentioned, when you create this RFC 6598 side arranges, I'm just gonna show you here very quickly. We go to the, your VPC. So this is the VPC I'm using to create those three subnets. And if you go to the subnets, you see here, I have created three subnets, which is of RFC 6598 on the same VPC where my cluster, EKS cluster is sitting. So once this is ready, the next thing which you need to do is like, you need to create some EN, three ENI objects. This ENI object is a CRD, which is installed in, which is local to Amazon and which is installed as part of your cluster. You don't have to install it again. It's like a security policy. You need to create three ENI configs objects representing each of these subnets. So in a nutshell, what we do is that we have the your control plane and node groups running on in three separate RFC 1918 side ranges, which is like normal side ranges. And your workloads are being configured to consume IPs from the CG net subnets. And how we are going to install it is that we're going to install ENI config objects like this. If you can look at here, I'm going to show you some of the ENI objects which I'm going to install. And the other thing which we want to do is that we will be also in, uh, need to make some changes in the AWS node, some of the environment variables of the AWS node. If you're looking, if you're asking what is AWS node, it is one of the core components which is installed when you create an EK, EKS cluster, for example, using EKS cuttle command or like a Terraform or any other thing. So once we have created this ENI config, I'm just gonna show what's inside one of these ENI config options. So if I look at it here, I'm just gonna see. So these are my, these are my three ENI config objects. So if I just gonna show you what's in this ENI object. So these are some, this is what you need to include in your ENI config. So ENI config, as I mentioned, it's a CRD custom resource definition, which is a CRD, which is installed as part of your Kubernetes cluster. And the thing which you need to install, uh, include in this one is that you just need to include the subnet um, of the, the subnet, which is in the US East 2A. So if you just go to the US East subnet, which is relevant here, you just need to mention what subnet ID in here. That's number one. 
and you just need to mention the security group which is used for your EKS cluster. So this is like an ENI config object which you need to install. Since I'm using three subnets in here, I will be I have defined three e, um, ENI config objects, and I just need to apply these things. So I'm just going to quickly apply these things. So the first step is done. So you have installed your ENI config objects. What does this ENI config object does is that it configures your cluster to use these subnets for your workloads. And the second thing is that, as I mentioned, you just need to make some changes in your AWS node. So these are some of the configurations which you have to do. Some of these configurations are not mandatory if you're using only the EKS custom networking, but some of these are really uh these are all of these are con, uh, mandatory if you're using rfc 6598 uh side ranges so if i just go back to i'm just going to make these changes very quickly in my cluster i will get back to these each of these uh variables which you want to set it here but Basically, what it does is that it configures your cluster to use the custom networking ENI config objects, and it allows you to create a branch ENI um, when a pod is actually being created. So if I look at a pod, which is actually right now, which is which has been running for the last half an hour, you can see that it uses a normal side range, same as your cluster is using. That's That's... That's like every day, that's just the normal thing which happens. Like you create a cluster and you deploy a workload. And the whole point of using the EKS custom networking is that we want to make sure the new workloads, if I just deploy a new workload, it will start consuming uh, IP from this side of range. And how I do it is like, as I mentioned, I made the changes in the AWS node, some of the environment variables which is required. And I installed the three ENI configs. And the next thing which I'm going to do is that you must be wondering, yeah, sure, if you have done all that, why it is not going to change? So the EKS custom networking is not going to change your existing workloads to switch to a new uh, IP from the new subnets. You have to scale out and scale in, and that's where your pods will start consuming an IP from those subnets. So what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to have a taint on the existing node. So there won't be any new nodes will be created on this one. This is this is for me to just to do the demo. And once I taint at the existing node, I'm gonna scale out to two, no, uh, two nodes. And then I'm just gonna scale my replica from one to two. So I'm just gonna taint this particular node quickly. And I'm just gonna wait until this node comes up and once that node comes up what i'm going to do is that i'm just going to scale my replicas from one to two and this is where you're going to see that um the new pod so you would see that the same deployment having two parts but it would be having two different um ips i mean two uh, the two parts will be consuming ips from two different address spaces so while we wait, I'm just going to cover the rest of the things as well. Uh, the final state. So this is the, not the final state or the second state. So this is the state, this is the, this was the current state. This is state number one. And this is state number two. This is where you can see that I have scale out and scale in. What that means is that the node group will be still using the same side of ranges. What that means is that your EC2 instances will be still using the same side of ranges as it used to be. That thing is not going to change. But your workloads or the workloads which is hosted in the new uh, nodes will start consuming an IP from the subnets which you just mentioned in your ENI config. So that's the, the state two. Um, 
of this one. And this is how an EN, um, ENI config object is going to look like, if you can see it here. Um, let's just see whether the, the node has come through. Yep, it hasn't come through yet. Just going to check my cluster. Yep, keep saying I'm just gonna. So while the node comes through, I'm gonna talk about some of the important points on this one, uh, the EKS custom networking. So if you just use the EKS cuttle command just to uh, create an EKS um, a cluster, there will be some default uh, plugins, which will be our add-ons, we call it, um, it will be installed. So out of that one, uh, one of the main things which you want to keep in note is that uh, the CNI plugin is very important because you, you're gonna need this CNI plugin, um, uh, some of the features of the CNI plugin, uh, the container network interface plugin um, to use the custom networking. And um, one of the things which we faced during rolling out EKS custom networking is that uh, if you, because as I mentioned, we have like 200 tenants and we won't be able to have specific routes for all the side ranges, all the custom side ranges, which we are actually creating for each of the tenant. So if you, basically what it means for a company like us is that we have to have the default route propagation on. And if you do have the default, default route propagation, uh, you need to make sure that the RFC CG NAT uh, side ranges do not propagate beyond, let's say for example, if you have a transit gateway, it won't uh, propagate beyond that. How you can manage is that you just need to have like a black hole to stop the propagation in, a, in, in your route tables. Let's say, in, for example, it could be your net gateway or a transit gateway to say, yeah, do not propagate, say the, it, it, the propagation ends there. And you need to make sure that the RFC 6598 side ranges, which you're creating is also in the same VPC. And um, if you're using two different security groups for the PKS and the node group, you just need to make sure the re reference in between those two security groups are there. Because as you mentioned, you you need to use, um, if you, you need to, technically, if you're having a separate security group for your node group, you just need to use that one for your ENI configs. And um, one of the coolest thing, which I want to explain here is that when, when you have your EKS custom networking with the RFC 6598, any communication of a, of a particular workload will be using each zero. So that means the default network um, um, interface of the EC2 instance. So if, we, if I try to just communicate from the pod, it would have the identity, in other words, of the EC2 instances or, or the worker node. Yep, so I can see the two pods. And what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to quickly scale the replicas to two. Yeah. So this is what this is just an example of what you see here. So you see here that you got the same one deployment. So if you look at here, you got the same deployment. You got one deployment. But if you look at the two parts, one part is actually using um, the custom networking, which we have configured. The other part is actually using one of the side ranges of your EKS cluster. So what that means is that, as I mentioned, your new workloads, or if you scale out your old node, which will means that the workload will be transferred to a new, uh, new node. What that means is that technically, your new workloads will start using the new subnets. So that's that's the um, the main thing which I want to just show here. And if you if you look at the advantages, I did talk about a few things about the advantages. As I mentioned, it it promotes reusability across the teams, which is one of the big wins for us. And um, we can give on demand side ranges. 
If you're using EKS custom networking, it allows you to give an on-demand side, uh, side range experience. What that means is that you don't have to start with the bigger side ranges. You can start with a small and then you can grow up. But if you're using RFC 65998 side ranges, you pretty much can give like a 4,000 side range because it doesn't matter. And you can just pretty much give the same side range to everyone. So it doesn't matter. And one of the thing, one of the other big wins is that the firewalls. So you must be wondering here, Russian. So you, does it mean if I keep on changing my subnets for the workloads, um, does, does it mean that um, if the communication is going out of the VPC, do I need to whitelist those uh, new side ranges? Let's say your, your database is sitting in another cloud or on-prem. Do I need to whitelist? So the answer is no, as I mentioned you will be using each zero when the communication happens from one of these workloads to the outside. What that means is that it is literally using the side range of your EKS cluster. That it will get the each zero or the worker node uh, IP address. So you don't have to raise any firewalls. And that's that's one of the coolest thing because we, it, it, it's kind of like plug and play because if, I, if, if you want to give uh, resize your tenants side ranges, you can just have a new one and let the old one go. And the network team who is looking after the side ranges can actually reuse that one. They don't need to do anything. And the decoupling of the subnets actually promotes the actual disaster recovery as well as um, um, IP exhaustion when, it, when the actual EKS cluster needs to uh, scale out. Because as I mentioned, one of the main problems we had is that you know we, we, we had a cluster, but the, the tenants keep deploying a lot of workloads and unfortunately, when the cluster needs to scale out because the heavy amount of workloads, it actually couldn't scale out because it did not have any IPs left in the side ranges. So this is an actual problem you might face. You might be having this cluster and thinking, yeah, sure, 512 is still fine. Just in a case of a spike happen in your traffic and if your workload scales out, then you need to understand if you're using the same side ranges, there's a risk that you know you might not have enough IPs for your cluster to grow. Um, that's pretty much it, guys. Um, if you have any questions, um, I can ask. But I just wanted to thank you for the people who actually work with me. Um, there are a couple of people. Paul, you're sitting here. Thanks for that. Um, who's been a uh, kind of a mentor in NAB when it comes to these kind of things, and um, Andrew Byron, my uh, manager, and the. GM in our net platform and one of the um, AWS support engineers, Pandi, who has been with, working with me quite closely uh, during the process. It wasn't an easy process, but I think um, it, it looks really um, complicated. But in a nutshell, it just allows you to scale your clusters really, really well. That's all I want to tell. Thank you. If there's any questions, I'll take. Otherwise, I'll pass on to the next. Um, uh, you mentioned that you solved the IP address exhaustion issue by reusing the same um, CDN. CDNet, yes. Uh, so why is that, like, why use that CDN rank? Like, can't you just do the same with any private IP rank? You just pick one private IP rank. Uh, from now on, we use this only for EPS workloads. Uh, we're going to reuse it in, in all the tenants, don't use for other purpose. Correct. That's a good question, uh, man. Thanks. Unfortunately, I don't have something okay. like uh, Nilesh to give it to you, but I'll just answer that one. So in a bigger organization uh, like NAV, uh, like NAV, what happens is that uh, there are quite a lot of very, um, uh, things which you need to consider if you're trying to reuse the private IPs, especially the, the one of the main problem is that the security. So let's assume that you have, I mean, you're a tenant and I'm a tenant. We both got the same private IPs for some reason. We both, because number one, which we need to remember is that both your AWS account and my AWS account as two tenants belongs to the same organization. So the network team manages these IP pools. And then what that means is that that private IP will be consumed by your EC2 instances, as well as my EC2 instances. So what does it mean um, if there's a breach? If there's a breach and if they find out that a net of some kind of like, I'm just telling a small example, some of the, some of the questions which I was asked from this, uh, security architects when we are trying to deploy this one. What does it mean that your EC2 instance and my EC2 instance having the same IP? 
how does the network team, how quickly, they still can, obviously they can, how quickly they can res, um, respond to that kind of an in incident to say, yep, sure, this is breaching this particular AWS account or not this one. So there are, there are a few considerations which goes into that. Uh, so that's why at NAP, you, you honestly can't actually uh, reuse. That's one of the reasons you can't actually reuse the same private IP across different AWS account, which belongs to the same uh, uh, AWS organizations. And also that's quite a lot. I mean, in terms of firewalls, because let's say you got a site or range and you need to open it for over uh, like your on-prem. If you, if you happen to open that site or range for an on-prem, does it mean I can access as well? Because I have the same site or range. So you, this is this some of the considerations. So you, that's the reason. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Another question. Sure, go for it. Um, I do not know. Sorry, yeah. this is a few firewalls. Um, so when it comes to different sets of IP ranges, I don't have to have any IP ranges. Yeah. I find all these people love to improve the developing themselves. Yes, of course. Um, TPS and what are the issues with comparing the IP ranges or just saying that they were not doing it? Correct. Um, we never had um, any serious problems. Uh, the main thing which we want to make sure is that, um, so we also have like monitoring and we use primarily um, Splunk and we probably gonna move to open search. Uh, one of the things which we had to consider is that um, when the logs are being ported to the Splunk, the Splunk logs, does it show the each zero? Each zero means the actual worker node, which is actually that particular part is running. Or is it showing the CG NAT or RFC 6598 side range IP of the pod? Personally, I thought the other way at the first one, but actually communication, when the communication happens, yes, it shows the zero, but for the logs, it was actually showing you the correct um, actual, not the actual, the CG NAT. So it wasn't a problem, like, as I said, I explained to the, in the previous one, because Splunk logs goes to a particular index. So you don't have the same index for all the 200 tenants. So you, you got like 200 indexes at least for the 200 tenants. So I might see a log of let's say 164 saying, okay, doing something. So I know I, I can easily trace back where, where's my landing zone. And if the same IP is being used by another tenant, it goes to a separate um, index. So your question is Oh, that's a good question. I think uh, I'd like to ask that question. Does you know that how much uh, how much time it took for Google to completely convert into IPv6? I'm not going to answer that. You should check that in the internet. That's number one. And if you look at it, we got an ecosystem which has created alerts, monitoring, and also um, the scaling. I caught a lot of things based on IPv IPv4. I know the IPv6 is something. If you go to the AWS, they they easily say, "Yeah, mate, just migrate to the IPv6." But it is not as simple as you think. And if you look at the firewall amount of firewalls like NAP would have, and amount of firewalls which we have to reconfigure if you want to move from IPv4 to IPv6. We probably have to stop everything and probably have like had to have like a really big core team working only on that. It's a really a fancy object uh, thing. A anyone who has done that um IPv6 migration probably can speak, probably can speak in the next one of the meetups because that's a huge, huge activity. I I, I said my 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 boss Andrew Biden asked the same question. I said, like, I don't know what I want to be involved in that because uh, I, I I because Definitely that's going to go, something is going to go wrong, terribly wrong. And I don't want my head on that. Yes. Yeah. Excellent solution. Um, on an implementation standpoint, um, the modules getting deployed within the UNI config, uh, where the outbox will be pointed to? Where, where is the? Outbox of 
DNA config. Like in next four weeks in Hunter Train, we yeah. have to DNA config. And there will be an outbound configuration for the communication externally to the subnet brain. Like for example, if it needs to pull an email, it needs yes. to talk to the external repository. Correct. All right. So if, you, if you're talking about the outbound uh, connectivity, you don't have to worry about the outbound connectivity. You don't have to configure any outbound con uh, um, connectivity for the subnets. You still need to have the uh, subnet uh, default rules, which allows the subnet to subnet communication. That's number one. One of the things which you need to have is that because you already have your EKS clusters on RFC 1918 cyber ranges. So you need to make sure that the communication between this RFC 1918 and this uh, other subnet is allowed. But for example, in your example, if it needs to fetch an image from, let's say, Artifactory or Docker, wherever it is, as I mentioned, the communication goes out of the VPC. When the communication goes out of the VPC, it will be using the ETH zero. That means the same side, of, the same IP in here, which is like, which is used for the EC2 instance. So if you have your firewalls whitelisted for this IP, then that's all. You never have to raise any firewall. That's one of the key things which I always say is to the tenants, 200 tenants. You never have to touch your firewall, but you have to touch your security groups within the VPC. Just, it, just the anomaly is that I'm, I'm trying to explain is that within NAP, you got different teams. You got the payments, you got the NEF, you got CPS. But you go outside the NAB, you don't introduce yourself as like, okay, I'm from CPS, nobody knows what is that. You just say, yeah, sure, I'm from NAB. Same like that. Within the VPC, it will have an identity. What that means is that if you have like an RDS, the security group which is used by that RDS need to whitelist this side range. Otherwise, the communication fails, given that it is on the same VPC. Anything outside doesn't count. Use the same side range as CPS. Okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we can have some time to um, run quiz and uh, give away our swags. Okay, thank you. Members, yeah, thanks, everyone. Let's go quickly. If you would like to uh, connect with the Wi-Fi here, here is the Wi-Fi name guest and uh, the code. I just keep this slide for one minute. Just do it quickly. All good. Okay, I'm moving forward. So yeah, before we quiz, I quickly mention uh, this also very important to us. So um, your feedback is variable for us. Uh, if you can just capture this QR code again. Um, yes, in anything input, whatever. Yeah. Um, for us, uh, important anything your interest or anything you can help with us. Um, thank you. And move forward. Uh, so for our today's um, prizes, so we have a regular uh, sponsor for us from cloud access and six months access from cloud platforms and learning platform and uh, three um, for today for the winners and the second is one free cube days of Chile pass well so yeah <laughs> so Tiago is very interested <laughs> yeah and uh, next we also have a three um, half percent discount off code for cakes exams there's a sponsor, um, yeah, for the, our um, Christmas, uh, including Russia. Yeah. And also, uh, thank you, Paul. Where is Paul? <laughs> yeah, and Paul, 
Um, actually, my boss, 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 you were um, the head of uh, NAP Global Tech Academy, sponsor a few more aspects um, for us. So, yeah. And uh, so let's go straight forward and quickly run through that. Mm. Scan the QR code. We're waiting. All of you join. But the online attendee or able to access all oh, good, everyone. Ten seconds, come down, then we can get started. Okay. Looks like we need to do one more time. Sorry for that. <laughs> Sorry, I ignored the previous one. We need to kick, um, click the start, then scan the QR code, then. The participant joining should, yes, I'm sure up here. More. Mm. Now we should have more. Um, Sammy, can you help check? Only one. Do we have more? Only two. Yeah. We're waiting on the brain to join. Okay, all good. Oh, wait. wait for more second. Or Tiago, if you can have a look at, yeah. Yeah, all good. All right, so. So just um, be aware of uh, each of the questions have uh, 30 seconds to answer. The first question, KXGPT has native integration with which of the following tools or services? AWS Grafana, JCP Grafana, AWS Processors, JCP Processors. Which one is correct? Yeah, good job, everyone. Most of you are correct. And uh, and mention um, worth to mention you know, the uh, correct the read is the first thing, then the um the faster better. Okay, so let's go <clears throat> next question. Um, it's lucky we don't have much question today. So totally nine. Then we go to next one. Ready. Which of the following filters are unused by defaulting case GPT? In 10 seconds. Oh, 
Yeah, that thing seems that the easy one. Next, so question. Which command is used to find problems within the cluster? Lucas Mosson, do you made a decision already? Cool. Let's see how many you're correct. Now, oh, cool. So go straight away to the next question. Which of the following backend providers are supported by Kate's GPT? A little bit cheeky, but should be okay. Let's check leaderboard on oh, halfway. Who is leading the board now? Who is the <laughs> Or C. Okay, change. The labels change. KD7 is the, the top one. So we're including the um, attending online. So probably we'll, the top one is the attending online. So we'll go next. Uh, next, so, um, following five by five questions about the um, rashes topics. What is the mandatory CAKES object which is required to config EKS costume networking? Three, two, one. That's the answer. And I config also got correct answered. And next, we run it a bit more quick. What are mandatory add on or plugin required for EKS costume networking? Should be the easy one for all of you. Yeah, the first AWS, VBC, CNI. And next, the last, uh, so the last, so here. Yeah. What is the mentoring? X object required for application workloads when config with KEKS custom networking. Is this a great group policies or ENI config or ingress controller or all security policies? You can see Yang is leading the board right now. Mm, a little bit tricky. <laughs> oh, last minute change. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> All right, so the last second question was it. Which of the E and V variables can be used to switch off the EKS custom networking? And in, and in six seconds. Oh, cool. All right, so last questions is what are FC 
six five nine eight side range. Let's see if there will be change on the later board at the last minute. Well, now at the minute moment, Yang's leading the ball. The second is Henry, third is Rash. All right, cool. Yeah, let's check a little board and quiz. Go to little board. Let's find the final little board. The top one, Yan. Congrats. <laughs> yeah. So, are uh, you choose um what, which which um price you wanted to take? Obviously, which Honestly. one has more value, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's only one, but I can, in baseball, it's fine. Oh, I need. <laughs> you want to head yeah. the top? <laughs> Anybody? I mean, and the the other leaderboard who is interested with the uh, good day? Maybe we following by the leaderboard. If yeah. you don't, yeah, that's fine. Want to take it? Or... I'll take the code cloud. Access. Yeah, code cloud access. You, 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 serious? You, you don't want the... Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Code cloud. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Yen. Congrats. Yeah. <laughs> Number one today. Code cloud access. And um, one go. And um, one's gone. And the next are rush. Yeah. Yeah. I think both of that as well. Code cloud. Code cloud uh, access, right? The, okay. The access, right? Code cloud access. Yeah. You want a code cloud? So, yeah. yeah um, okay, I'll, cool. I'll are you sure? Oh, 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 okay. Yeah, you, you don't need to take this anymore. <laughs> you will have lots of bread. You already gave me this. <laughs> oh, congrats. Uh, who's the so the winner? Congrats. Congrats. Hash and what would you like? Hash. We have let's uh go to go. That, that's just there is nobody want to keep it. Yeah, let's, 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 let's quick recap this. Um, process we have two code cloud access gone, and then one uh, yeah, remain. If you choose code cloud, that's all right. Okay, yeah. good. I'll give you Amazing, yeah. yeah. Let's take a photo. Yeah, <laughs> which one? I'm not sure. Yeah. We, we need you to provide us the full name, email address. Code because... cloud, right? Okay, code cloud. Cool. Go back. Uh, no, this one. Okay. Fourth. It's gone. Winner. Fourth winner. Yeah, no, no, it's oh. gone. Yeah. Oh, nice. Oh, what's the congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's the people's. That's the course. Since now we just five people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, which would you like to take? Which oh, price? so I think Coupe Day is not taken, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's the uh, most likely. Yeah, yeah, I'll go to, yeah I'll go <laughs> that's what we are in. Yeah, yeah, okay. Actually, yeah. Sorry, can I keep this off? It's up to you, it's up to you. Okay, go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks. The cute day's gone, guys. <laughs> uh, who, uh, Henry. Congrats, Henry. Which prize would you like to take? Congratulations. We have uh, three. <laughs> what, what would you like? Yeah, but we don't have much stuff left. Uh, we have those. Yeah, you have to take both of us. <laughs> no more. Fine. You are volunteers. We, we can get one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Fine, fine. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Come for help. And six. Go. Six. We know Ross. Oh, hi. Congrats. Congratulations. And we. Yeah. Uh, we do Kubernetes oh. certification. We still have the fifty percent of the code yeah. can be shared. Otherwise, tissue. 
We don't have. We don't have t-shirt today. Oh, we don't have t-shirt today. We need uh, all of our volunteer, all of our members to help us to promote. You know, you know. Hopefully, we can get the more sponsors to help us. To, to there promote. was Kubernetes Cloud. Oh, nothing. But... The these are the stuff that we have. Yeah, thanks to the NAB, it gets us, yeah, you know, the songs again. Yeah. <laughs> a pretty good one. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good. And who's the next? No, Yoshi. Yoshi. <laughs> congrats. Congrats, Lex. Um, And we have. Yeah, these are the stuff we have. That's a success. Yeah, for success. Like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, let's take a photo. Yeah. Where's the sign? Let's take it. Thank you. And we still have a few um socks and also three uh half discount code for cakes exams. So we can continue. Uh who's next? Is here. Over. Congratulations, Congratulations. Do you do Kubernetes exam? Yeah, you already have. What's next? CKS? You already have? Uh, not yet. Yeah. Okay. Do, do you like the 50% of the code? Uh, yeah. Which is pretty good. If yeah. you want to do CKS, it can save you like a, about $200. Yeah. So, yeah, what is your full name, email address? We will get you the code. Okay. Yeah, let's have a photo. Thank you so much. Make sure you get us your details. Yeah. Thank you. And next, Pat. Hi. Congrats, Pat. It's okay. It's okay. Thank you. Congratulations. Do you like a notebook or you want to do the exam? Um, I like the 50% of it. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. yes. I love yep. it. <laughs> it's an active learner. I love it. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. So we um, will take uh, give away the last one. Venera. Uh, Venera. Who's the? Venera. Venera. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do it anyway, so <laughs> you can take it. You, you want to do the take. exam? What would you like? Yeah, I'll just plan to figure something out. Yeah. Mm. Mm. And I could take the Someone box. Can. You could take the you box. Take, take box? One. Yeah, take one. Well, take one. We already bring. Um, I'll take the box. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Cool, cool. Uh, good, Elsa and. Uh, yeah, just one thing. Would you mind to come um together here and then we take the photo? Open mic a little bit. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So just a little bit the open mic um for the photo. Um so the Kesu is organized the second hands-on workshop. And uh I will send you by mail some invitations. So this workshop will be a little restricted in uh seats. So I'm getting by and make some limitation to get this seat. So uh, be aware that you will receive some mails. And if you want to learn more by doing on um, this time, it will be in AKS uh, Carpenter. And that's it. Thank you. Okay. Let's take a group of photos, please, guys. Yeah. Come on, guys. Let's take a group of photos. Thank you, everybody. You can the I you're the one who got the 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.